What voices do we listen to? Who has an influence on our lives? Who guides our opinions and our values? The way we act, the decisions we make. Where do we go for advice and for wisdom? Maybe we go to family or friends. Maybe it's the internet. Maybe we're influenced by the, the newspapers and the magazines uh, that we read. Also, we listen to the media, listen to the world around us. And sometimes perhaps we're swayed by the appealing messages that we hear. Maybe messages about equality and justice, which have many good things about them. Maybe they're not built always on the very good foundations, certainly in the society in which we are today. All sorts of things can come into our thinking, and maybe without us even realizing how much we're absorbing the information around us and absorbing the values around us. Sometimes we take it in without even realizing. Or are we listening to Scripture? Are we listening to God and what he has to say to us? Is that where we turn for wisdom? Is that what molds the way we think? Well, here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul warns about difficult times there in verse 1, or perilous times we have in, in other versions as well. And he lists all sorts of things going on. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, and, and so on. He has this long list of horrible things, and we think, oh, well, you know, he must be talking about the world out there. But I don't think he's talking about the world out there. I think he's talking about people in the church. Because in verse 5, he says that these people have the appearance of godliness, but deny its power. The world, we expect to be like this. But we don't expect this kind of behavior and attitudes in the church. And why were people behaving like this? Why would, uh, why would uh, and when, when we think about the last time, so we're not thinking about just before Christ comes again, the whole period from Jesus Resurrection to his coming again is the last times. And, uh, and Paul is warning Timothy, you know, you're going to be facing this yourself it's back in the first century. So it's not just something for the future, it's something for us to think about now. And uh, he says, uh, uh, um, you know, these things are going to happen. Why are people going to behave like this? Why are people, even in the church, so called Christians, going to be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God and, and all these kind of other things? But well, it's because they listen to false teachers. He speaks about in this chapter. They've listened to the world. They've listened to the false teachers. And the false teachers are coming from this angle. They've listened to them rather than the Bible. Maybe some of them are the kind of people that uh, Paul speaks about in chapter 4 and verse 3 when he talks about the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They just want to hear what they want to hear. And so they go after these other people and listen to them. But Paul says to Timothy, and Timothy is uh, that uh, young man who's he's set there in Ephesus to put things right there, to get things going there. And he says to Timothy, I want you to hold fast to the Bible. I want you to preach the word. This is what you have learned, he says. This is what you have learned from me. He had observed Paul's conduct. He, observed, he, had, he had watched him at work. He'd seen his faith in, in verse um, 10 here says, he's, you follow my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my, my faith and so on, and my persecution. You followed all this to Timothy. You know I'm a reliable, faithful man of God. I've, I'm faithful to, to the Lord. And you've observed that, and you've heard the gospel. You've heard the truth from me. But you also heard it from your mother and your grandmother, Eunice and Lois. You've, you've heard it from them. We read about that in, in chapter 1, that they were godly women who were a great influence on Timothy. And even long before Paul ever met Timothy, he'd been under their influence. And so he says in verse 14, As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it. And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, the scriptures, the Old Testament in that case, 
which were able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So you've heard these things, and you've learned these things that make you wise for salvation, the most important things you could ever hear. The important things that any of us could ever hear are those things that tell us of salvation, of how we can be right with God, of how we can have eternal life, how our sins can be forgiven, how we can be accepted by God. That's the most important thing of all, isn't it? How we can be saved from hell to come and, and made fit to be with God in heaven. That's the most important thing. We need to hear that. And that's in the scriptures. And that's what Timothy grew up with. That's what he heard and learned. And Paul said, I want you to hold fast to these things. Continue in these things. Hold fast to the Bible. Mere human thinking will lead us astray. What we need to listen to is the Bible. Human thinking will lead us into the paths that he talks about at the beginning of the chapter. Lovers of self and lovers of money and so on. Listen to the Bible and it will lead us to Christ. Even though the Bible is regarded as outdated by so many people, they say, oh, that's rubbish, that's just, uh, just old-fashioned, that's, uh, you know, that, that, that's just old, outdated thinking. Some people even see the Bible as an evil thing, and more and more in our society, people are regarding the Bible and the Christian faith as something evil, something to be spurred and, and turned away from and got rid of. But the Bible is not like that, is it? The Bible is central, and we need pastors who will preach the Bible. That's the task, the, the main task of the pastor, isn't it? To preach the Bible, to feed the flock of God. That's what we're looking for Tom to be doing in, in the months to come, in the years to come. It's central to the church, isn't it? And we need to be people who submit to the Bible, who say the Bible is our rule of faith and life. The Bible is what we seek to obey. It is the instrument for our sanctification, for our growth in grace. The Bible is what Christ held on to so much. When he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, again and again he answered, it is written, it is written, it is written. So the Bible was his answer. The Bible is what he stood on. The Bible is what he lived by. And that's how we should be too. So I just want to bring three points. I, I did bring a PowerPoint on a stick, and then I forgot to give it to Martin. So, um, so you, you have to forgive me. I'll try and make them really clear, so you don't have to worry about forgetting them. The first thing is the divine origin of Scripture. The divine origin of Scripture. And we come to that famous verse of verse 16 of 2 Timothy 3. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. And so we'll be sending our thoughts mostly this morning. All scripture, or every scripture, is breathed out by God. When he talks about the sacred writings in verse 15, he's referring to the Old Testament. It was a, a way that they would describe the Old Testament scriptures. But when he comes into verse 16, he says, all scripture. And that includes now the New Testament, because that's uh, obviously Timothy didn't grow up with the New Testament. He was, it hadn't been written, but now it was being written. And all scripture, all that which God has given us. And we now have the 66 books of the Bible, don't we? The 66 books that, that make the complete Bible. And all of that is breathed out by God. Or in all the versions of the versions, given by inspiration of God. We use the word inspiration, don't we? The Bible's inspired, but the word literally means breathed out, and that's where we've got that here on the ESV. God breathed out the Bible into the minds of the Bible writers. The Bible originated from the mind of God. It didn't originate from man. It's his revelation he revealed it to the prophets and the writers, and he breathed these words into them. They retain their own personality, their own identity. But, and so we find different styles. If you read Paul, he'd be different to John, and John would be different to Peter, and so on. But God still breathed those words 
into and through those men. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 21, or verse 20, I should say first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was produced by the will of man, but men spoke of God, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And the picture there is of a, of a boat with a sailboat. And it's going along the sea. The wind is just blowing gently into the sail. And it's, and it's going along the sea. And they've been carried along by the wind. And that is how the writers of Scripture were. They were carried along by God's Holy Spirit, given the words that they should, that they should write, inspired in their hearts and minds. But you might say, well, we've got different versions and different translations. Are they all inspired? Well, we can't quite say that. It was the original documents, the original parchments on which Paul and others wrote. They were the ones that were, that were truly inspired, weren't they? And those have been copied and translated. But we've got a pretty accurate uh, knowledge of, 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 of what was written. Um, and, uh, and so we've got reliable and accurate translations of those, you know, translated right from the original languages. Now, those who say, well, it was translated from, from, from Greek to, to this and to that and to the other, and, and they eventually got into English. But no, it goes from Greek to English, or in the Old Testament, Hebrew to English. It goes right from the original translations, the, the original uh, languages, and translated just that once. And we, we can check it out. And so, although you cannot say the Bible you have in your hand in English, that every word of that has been inspired, the original were inspired, and what we have is reliable and accurate translations of what God said. We're thankful to have it in our own language. Thankful we don't have to learn Hebrew and Greek in order to read our Bibles. So we can say that this is the word of God. The word of God. What a dignity. What power. What authority that gives to this book. This isn't just the best wisdom of men. This isn't just human efforts to try and explain God and reality and, and to show us the way to live. And if it was just men's best efforts, we could take it or leave it. You could say, well, yeah, I like what they say or I don't. So it's Confucius or if it's Buddha or some other religious teacher, you can take it or leave it. But this is not from men, it's from God. It's what God has given to us, what God has revealed to us. It comes with all the authority of God and the wisdom of God and the truth of God. That's why Paul says to Timothy, continue in this, preach this. As I say, many people regard it as outmoded. And they say we know better than that now. Oh, it's all so primitive, isn't it? We don't need the Bible to tell us how to live. We can work it out for ourselves. Well, that's human pride. And when we ignore the Bible, things start to unravel, don't they? And we can see it in society today. What a mess that our society is in, in so many ways, isn't it? When it comes to, to family life and to, to relationships and to, uh, and to all sorts of things. And what a mess the world is in. Why? Because we don't live by God's word. The Bible's never outmoded. The Bible's God's word. And it's always relevant. But then there's the profitability of Scripture. We must hold the Scripture because it's profitable to us. It's the, it's the divine origin of Scripture, the profitability of Scripture. Because it's God's word, it is profitable, isn't it? It teaches us what we need to know. It molds our lives. And so Paul lists things that the word of God does for us. In verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. It's there to teach us, to teach us both what we call doctrine, you know, facts about God and about man and about Christ and about the world and so on, and practice how we should live, instructions to, to guide us. 
It gives us information. Reveals to us, yes, the wonder of who God is. The wonder of his character. The beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. The wonder of his work. The greatness of the, the work of salvation. Tells us who, what we're like, really and truly. It reveals in our hearts, doesn't it? Tells us about the life to come. Gives us so much information, doesn't it? Gives us the commandments of God. Teaches us the, the, the way to live. This information is the foundation for what we believe and what we do. So there's teaching and there's reproof. Now that doesn't sound so good, does it? The original word means conviction. Something that convicts you when you're doing wrong. It convicts your wrong behavior. It convicts you of your wrong beliefs. This is when the Bible makes you feel guilty, ashamed. When it shrivels you and think, oh, dear, I'm not living as I should be living. That's what the Bible does. But also corrects. It's there for correction. To restore us. To bring us back. The negative side is, is reproof, isn't it? It warns us when we leave the, the, the right path, go the wrong way. It says, you're going the wrong way. Correction is saying, this is the way you should go. Directs us back to the right path. It warns us, for instance, not to worship idols. But it corrects us and says, no, worship the living God. It warns us not to lay out treasures on earth. But it corrects us and says, now put the kingdom of God first. And so on. So the two, that's kind of the opposite sides of the coin. And it trains us in righteousness. And the word train here is the word you would use for training up a child, for, for rearing a child. And here it is, and, and with a child, you, you want them to develop, you want them to mature, you want them to, 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 to grow up, don't you, in their thinking, in their ways. And so the Bible helps us to grow up spiritually, to develop Christian character, to grow into the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, to grow into likeness to him. Well, there's a lot of overlap in those, in those four terms. Don't get worried about uh, distinction, distinguishing one from another too much. But it amounts to this. The scriptures teach us the truth and the means of our, and is the means of our sanctification. It's the Bible that guides the way we should live, what we should believe and how we should live it out. It's the Bible that helps us to grow. There's the old uh, chorus that uh, many of you may remember that um, you know, if you want to, 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 to um, read your Bible, Day after day, if you want to grow and uh, read your Bible, keep reading it, keep taking that in if you want to grow. In the Peanuts cartoon, on one occasion, Sally, one of the characters there, was struggling to remember her memory verse. And she's saying, maybe it was something from the book of re-evaluation. She was getting muddled up with the book of Revelation there, but re-evaluation, re and that's what the Bible does in our lives, isn't it? We re-evaluate our lives. We compare our lives as they are with what they should be. It helps us to see what we ought to be. The Bible is a transformative thing, isn't it? The Holy Spirit uses the Word of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't work in us just in a vacuum, does it? He takes the Word of God and applies it to us to help us to grow makes it profitable to us. A priest in Belgium once rebuked a young woman and her brother for reading that bad book, as he called it. And she replied, well, a little while ago, my brother was a gambler, a drunkard, and made such a noise in the house that no one could stay in it. But since he began to read the Bible, he worked with industry. He no longer goes to the pubs. He no longer plays cards. He brings money home to his little elderly mother. And she says, how is it that such a bad book produces good fruits? Well, this is the book that produces good fruits, isn't it? Those who live by the Bible will produce good fruit, will change us for the better. And it's sufficient for us as well. Verse 17 says, you know, he teaches and, and corrects and so on, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. 
the man of God may be equipped for every good work, fully equipped. That's what the original is all saying. The man of God is equipped indeed for every good work. He's fully equipped by the Bible. It's sufficient for our Christian life to equip us to live out that life as we should. But who is the man of God here? There are some commentaries that say the man of God is the pastor, or, the, or Timothy, or the preacher, and uh, it gives him all the tools he needs for the work. And there's others who say, well, it's the congregation. Well, I don't think we have to choose between the two. Paul is saying to Timothy, look, you're a man of God. The Bible will equip you. It will work in your life. It will sanctify you. But not just you, but anybody. You're just one example. It will equip you as the man of God, but it will equip others to be men of God as well, or women of God. And uh, it will sanctify them and help them to be everything they need to be. This is our food. This is our staple diet to enable us to become mature Christians. So I just want to apply that for a moment. One way is we need to listen to the word of God. It's not enough just to hear it. Not enough just to read it even. We need to take it in. We need to be really listening. How often do we leave a church service and by the time we've got to our car door, we've forgotten what we heard? How often do we read our Bible in the morning and by the time we've had our breakfast, we can't remember what we read. The preacher Gypsy Smith told of a man who said he had received no inspiration from the Bible, although he'd gone through it several times. And Gypsy Smith said to him, let it go through you once, then you'll be a different man. He had gone through the Bible, let the Bible go through you, he says and you'll be a different man. Let the Bible have an influence in our lives. In our daily devotions, we read through uh, a systematic book of the Bible, but on Saturdays, we do it a little differently. I say to, 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 to anybody who happens to be in the household at the time, and there are not many of us at the moment, um, but has the Bible spoken to you this week? Is there a passage you want to share this uh, tonight that uh, has spoken to you this week. Would you be able to think, you know, you get to Saturday night and think, well, actually, you know, on Wednesday, that is what I read, and that really stuck with me. Or do we come up with a blank and say, well, I can't think of anything, actually, that has really struck me. But a good practice has come to Sunday, and, and uh, you've got Sunday afternoon. What are you going to do Sunday afternoon? One of the things you can do is to think, what have I learned from the Bible this week? Think about what, you, what you heard in church in the morning, but also what did you read from the Bible during the week? What did you hear at the prayer meeting? Can you remember it? Has it made a difference to you? Have you learned more of Christ? Has it deepened your faith? What has the Bible prompted you to do that you hadn't, weren't doing before? What has it challenged you over? I know not, not every time we read the Bible it's going to impinge upon our personal circumstances right at that moment. It may be preparing us for the future. It may be giving us good grounding. Surely God's word has to be taken in, doesn't we have to listen to it and say, what has it got to say to me? Not just, oh, that's the story of David again, or that's the story of Abraham again, the yeah, interesting story, but what does it say to me? What does God have to say to me? It's God's word, but not just a dead word, is it? It's God speaking to, it, to us through it as well. So let's listen. But secondly, don't be offended by the word. I wonder if you've ever gone out from here on a Sunday morning and said, the preacher was getting at me this morning. <laughs> well, I hope the preacher doesn't set out to get at some individual. If he's got something to say to an individual, he should say it to the individual. But sometimes God is taking that word and shaking us up, isn't he? 
But if the cap fits, wear it. If the cap fits, wear it. If it convicts you, don't just say, I don't want to listen to that. Don't want to think about that anymore. Don't turn away from it. But say, God, you are speaking to my soul. You are challenging me. Help me to put things right in my life. In Psalm 95 and verses 7 and 8, we read this. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Don't say, oh, I don't want to listen to that. Thank you very much. That's uncomfortable. God speaks to us. He's wanting to do us good, isn't he? He's wanting to speak to us. Sometimes he wounds in order to heal. So don't be offended by the word. Listen to it. Don't be offended. But thirdly, obey the word. By God's grace, put it into practice. When it points out something in your life, let's do it. I know sometimes I'll put things off. I know God has said, I ought to be doing something. And, well, it takes me a while to get around to it sometimes. If we've listened, we've heard what it has to say to us, maybe it's convicted us of something, let's do it. Because it's only by obeying the word of God we shall really profit from it. We shall be equipped for every good work. All right, Tori said this, you may talk about power, but if you neglect the one book that God has given you as the instrument through which he imparts and exercises his power, you'll not have it. You may read many books and go to many conventions. You may have your all-night prayer meetings to pray for the power of the Holy Ghost. But unless you keep in constant and close association with the one book, the Bible, you will not have power. And if you ever had power, You'll not maintain it except for the daily, earnest, intense study of that book. And this is what he says that's really challenging. 99 Christians in every 100 are merely playing at Bible study. And therefore, 99 Christians out of every 100 are mere weaklings when they might be giants, both in their Christian life and in their service. Are we playing at Bible study? Or we're studying God's word because we want God to change our lives. We hear God's word. We listen to the sermon because we want God to speak to us. Did you pray this morning that God would speak to you? Did you pray every Sunday, God, will you speak to me? Show me what you want me to know, what you want me to hear, what you want to do. But influence my life for good. Let's not play at Bible study. Power will come when we're sticking with God's word. So there's divine origin of scripture, the profitability of scripture, and finally preaching scripture. And Paul says, on the basis of what he's just said about holding to the, to the Bible, he says, Timothy, you have God's word, the word that will help people grow in godliness. Now I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, Preach the word. Verse 2 of chapter 4. Preach the word. Now you preach it. That's the, that's the great task of the pastor. That's what he's to do, is to preach the word of God such that it will make an, influ- an impact on people's lives. He's to preach it to help people to grow. He's to preach it. Whatever the hearers think of it. Whatever the response might be. I hope it will be a good response. Sometimes it isn't, is it? Preaching the word is going to be central to the, ch- to the life of the church. It's tempting to look elsewhere, isn't it? Especially when we're wanting to reach people, want, want people to come in. We're tempted to look out elsewhere. Let's make the services more entertaining, we might think. So we'll enjoy coming, have a good time, make them more lively, make them seeker-friendly, 
Not in the, in the certain ways in which we should be, should, should, um, should put up barriers to, 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 to stop people who are seeking, but now let's just tone it down, let's just make it nice and comfortable and so they'll just feel at home and at ease and, and everything will go well and, and, uh, and just give them a good, a good experience. And that's not what we're here for, is it? Some of them have turned to music. So let's have lots and lots and lots of really good, upbeat music. Others turn to miracles or to prophecies because that's exciting. But our task, Timothy, your task, the pastor's task, the church's task, preach the word. I'm not saying we should make our services boring. <laughs> The centrality must be the word. Not, we're not here to have a great time. We're here to hear what God has to say, aren't we? There is in God's word, that's where we see Christ. That's where we're made wise into salvation. That's where we're taught how to please and serve God. It may be tempting as well to want it watered down a bit, make it a bit more palatable. And let's forget some of those parts of the Bible that are a bit difficult to deal with. Let's not offend anyone. You know, let's don't talk too much about sin and judgment and hell and those kind of things. Let's let's leave those to one side. Let's not challenge people too much and and tell them that to, that to follow Christ may be costly. You know, that, that's, that's that's not so good, is it? Um, now let, let's just present a nice a, a nicer view. Let's just present one one side of things. Sometimes we want to people to make it more palatable. Then when uh, Paul says to Timothy in verse 3 of chapter 4, reprove, rebuke, and exhort, I think, well, that doesn't sound too appealing, does it? <laughs> Not to water it down. We have no right to water the Bible down. We have no right to preach only half of it. We're going to preach what God has given us. In a small church, and I know what that's like, of course, <laughs> When you see a visitor come in for the first time, maybe some of you don't know, or maybe some of you did know and have actually come in. And they'll come in without you expecting it, and it's very tempting to tone it down then. So I don't want to put them off. I want them to come back next week. We attempted to tone it all down. Of course, we don't want to deliberately blast them, do we? But um, do we want to sort of disguise a bit, make it a bit more palatable? What do people start coming? And then they hear the word of God preached and then they leave again. They say, oh, if only we'd been a bit different. They might have stayed. Paul says to Timothy, preach the word. In season, out of season. When it's popular, when it isn't. When people accept it and when they don't. When they come to hear it and when they leave it. No matter when it is, preach the word of God. There will always be those who will be looking for things that they want to hear. They can't handle the truth. And so they'll go looking for preachers who will give them what they really want. They have itching ears. Teachers will suit their own passions. But that is not profitable. It only leads back to the beginning of chapter 3. And all those wrong things, it won't help, will it? We must not waver. This is the power of God for salvation and for sanctification, isn't it? John MacArthur, an American pastor, told of a Jewish man who came to him one day and he's in real trouble. He said, oh, pastor, can you help me? You know, I've had two wives and two divorces and I'm living with someone in an adulterous relationship. And I run an abortion clinic. My job is to kill babies all the time. And, you know, I'm in a terrible mess. And what am I going to do with my life? Can you help me? And John MacArthur said, no, I can't help you. And the man looked down for a moment and then he said, but I know someone who can. And he gave him a Bible. He said, I want you to take this home. And I want you to read the Gospel of John. And when he told someone during the week that's what he'd done, they said, 
well, John, why don't you tell him a bit more? Why don't, you, why don't you give him some advice and some help? Just tell him to read the Bible. What good is that going to do? Well, the next week, the man came back. I said, Pastor, I read the Gospel of John. And he said, it completely changed me. I want to be a Christian. I want to be saved. I know who Jesus is. I want to, and I just want to know, and I just want to, to follow him. And in fact, he'd not just read the Gospel of John. He'd gone on to read Romans as well. That's the power of God's word, isn't it? And the Holy Spirit is at work through that word. This is God's word. This is what the church stands on. This is what the church preaches. This is what we believe. This is what we live by. This is the truth God has given to us. And this is the word that we will stick to. Not downplay it or compromise it. This is our nourishment. This is our means of growth. This is how we grow in godliness. Not just in knowledge, but in godliness and Christian character and faith. This is the power of God to save souls. Continue in those things, Paul says. Hold to these things. Preach the word. And let each of us treasure that word. Let's hold fast to it. Let's listen to it. Let's grow by it. And encourage your new pastor to keep preaching that word as it is. Or shall we just spend a moment in reflection and prayer before we listen to our last song? Let's think about what God might have said to us this morning that is, should make a difference in our lives. Lord God, we thank you for your word, for its truth, its purity, its beauty, for its wisdom. Lord, give us listening ears. Give us receptive hearts. Grant us your grace to live by it. Amen.